السلام علیکم مائی نیم از محمد علی خان کلیمنٹ جان اینڈ دس از چینل سی کیو نائنٹی سیون ٹوڈے آئی ایم گوئنگ ٹو ٹاک اباؤٹ کرٹیکل ڈسکورس انالیسس دس از جسٹ گوئنگ ٹو بی این انٹروڈکشن دیر ول بی ڈیٹیلس ان فالوئنگ لیکچرس وین وی ٹاک اباؤٹ کرٹیکل ڈسکورس انالیسس وی مسٹ بی کلیئر about what discourse itself means. Let's go for a very basic definition. And that I am bringing to you from a book called Discourse Analysis as Theory and Method. It's written by Marianne Georgensen and Louise Phillips. They say that discourse is a particular way of talking about and understanding the world. When they use the word talking, I must actually make it clear here that talking also includes writing. So when we talk or write about anything in the world, we are indulging in discourse. And an important point is not only that when we are talking about or writing about, but also when we are trying to understand the world around us. Because when we talk or write about something, that's discourse from our side. But when someone else is talking or writing about something, that is discourse from their side. And this give and take, all of it, is actually what discourse really means. Let's go a little more into detail in this respect. Our knowledge and representations of the world are the products of discourse. Another point which comes along here is that we are historical and cultural beings and our views and knowledge of the world are the products of historically situated interchanges among people. The simplest way to put this is that discourse has historical and cultural aspects. Also, since we are talking about knowledge, Then another point which they bring up is that knowledge is created through social interaction. This actually is the crux of the matter. When you talk about critical discourse analysis or when you deal with it as a teacher or as a student, the name of Norman Fairclough will always come up. And over here, let us see how Norman Fairclough defines critical discourse analysis. According to him, as he says in his book called Critical Discourse Analysis, The Critical Study of Language, Fairclough says that critical discourse analysis is an analytical framework for studying connections between language, power, and ideology. So the meaning of all this will come later on. I want to draw your attention to these words, language, power, and ideology. And that is all you need to keep in mind for the time being. Let me put it very simply that critical discourse analysis actually looks at the relationship between language, power, and ideology. These words should stick in your mind. This was Fairclough's definition of critical discourse analysis. Now, he has a three-dimensional model, but first of all, I would like to go below and go to a person called Toyn Van Dyke. According to Van Dyke, critical discourse analysis studies the way social power abuse, dominance, and inequality are enacted, reproduced, and resisted by text and talk in the social and political context. I, I know that that was rather heavy. When I read all the text, that seems to be a bit heavy. So let me explain it to you. In fact, let me just draw your attention to the fact that Fairclough speaks about power and Van Dyke also speaks about power. Van Dyke just goes forward one step and talks about the abuse of power and dominance. So I want you to keep in mind that critical discourse analysis is all about power and how language is used 
to create power, to maintain power, and, well, going by Van Dyke's definition, how to use and abuse power. When Van Dyke talks about dominance, which is actually, it means holding power over other people, he defines dominance as the exercise of social power by elites, institutions or groups that results in social inequality, including political, cultural, class, ethnic, racial, and gender inequality. You can always come back to this video and look at all these things. Let me just sum up a few things for you. Norman Fairclough's approach towards critical discourse analysis is scholarly. It's formal. He looks at the form of the language, whereas Toyn van Dijk looks at the direction in which language goes, and that is mostly political. Van Dyck's interpretation of critical discourse analysis or his view of critical discourse analysis is colored by political opinion. And now let's look at Fairclough's three-dimensional model of CDA. Three-dimensional simply means that it is in three parts or it has three angles to it. How those interact, I'm just going to explain it to you. First, just look at the screen where it says that one dimension is the text, the second dimension is discursive practice, and the third is socio-cultural practice. Well, what is the text? The text is whatever you are reading or hearing or even looking at. Because whenever text is discussed in terms of discourse and in terms of critical discourse analysis, it could be language in a written form, language in spoken form, and even language in some kind of representational form, which means that it could be a diagram or a picture. Yes, even that would be called text. So when we look at a text from Fairclough's point of view, we are looking at the vocabulary, we are looking at the grammar, we're looking at the syntax, and we are looking at the sentence coherence, which means, does the sentence make any sense? Does it really convey any meaning? Just at the back of your mind, carry that concept that Fairclough talks about power. So when the text is seen from the point of view of critical discourse analysis, we are actually looking at the vocabulary, the grammar, the syntax, and the meaning as they relate to power. And when we come to the point called a discursive practice, the, the next dimension in Fairclough's model, what does that mean? It means the processes relating to the production and consumption of the text. In simpler terms, let me say that if a person is speaking, that is a process. If the text is written down, well, writing it down or printing it out is a process. That is the production of it. If it is a drawn text, as we just said, that it can be in the form of a diagram, then the drawing of it, the, the action of speaking, writing, or drawing would be regarded as the production of the text and the consumption the consumption is when we are listening to a text being spoken or reading a text that's been printed or written or interpreting a text which has been drawn. This process is called the discursive practice. Then the third dimension is what he calls the socio-cultural practice. That is the socio-cultural historical conditions which govern these processes. We just said that a text could be well, written or spoken or even drawn. What influences 
the writing of a text, the speaking of a text, or even the drawing of a text, and also what influences the reading of a text, the listening of a text, and the interpretation of a text. All social influences on these processes, all cultural influences on these processes, and all historical influences on these processes constitute the socio-cultural practice. In coming lectures, I will be doing this with practical examples of a text so that this concept is clearer. The next lecture, which I will be recording, will be about intertextuality because intertextuality has a lot to do with Fairclough's three-dimensional model of CDA. So till the next lecture, I want you to just go over these things again so that you have a very basic concept about critical discourse analysis. And as a take-home message, I just want to repeat what I have already said. And whether you're looking at it from Fairclough's point of view, or whether you are looking at it from Twain Van Dyke's point of view, CDA concerns the way language is used to produce power, to gain it, to maintain it, to use it. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next lecture.